Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Alison Bashai. I am the founder of Form Function Studio and the curator of this uh, program series, Designed for Everyone. Um, this is our second installment of the program series and the first one that we're doing online in this format. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Goethe Institute and DC Public Library, our partners for this event. Without them, this would not be possible. And a little bit about the series. So Design for Everyone, um, the mission of our program series is to open up design conversations to a broader, more diverse audience. So in addition to being free, um, we are approaching some of these, or we're approaching all these topics from an entry level uh, format so that they're a bit more accessible to people who might just be starting the joining the conversation. Um, so now I will hand you off to our wonderful speaker for today, Ifoma. Um, I did want to uh, call your attention to the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, anytime throughout the presentation, you can um, submit a question for Ifoma and she will be addressing them at the end. Um, we have disabled the chat feature though, um, so all of your questions should go through the Q&A. Um, thank you so much. And thank you very much, Allison. Thank you to Form Function Studio, to the Curter Institute and the DC Public Library for inviting me to share my work. I'm really quite excited for the questions that will come up at the end of my talk. So I'm going to share my screen. So again, my name is Ifoma Evo, and um, I've been trained as an architect and urban planner and urban designer. And um, I'm also founding board member of Black Space Urbanist Collective, and I'll talk a bit about that later on. And I am a director and urban designer strategist in um, my own design studio, Creative Urban Alchemy. So I'm just this question of before I start into this question of you know, what is urban planning and design, I first wanted to start by saying that urban planning is an all-encompassing field that has many entry points. For me personally, my entry point, per point or unique perspective to planning has a lot to do with my background. I'm a Nigerian-American woman who was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I spent summers traveling to my mother's home country of Nigeria as a child. That upbringing has influenced the way I see cities and my worldview. I also studied architecture at Cornell University, and, um, and I have a passion for the intersection of design and social justice. I also studied urban planning at um, MIT in Boston. And all of these factors impact my approach to urban planning and design. And through this lecture, I plan on sharing my understanding of urban planning and design through the lens of projects that I've worked on in government, through the private sector, consulting, and through nonprofit work. So the question, what is planning? Um, urban planning and design is about facilitating the process of creating change and how we use, use land and how we develop our built environment. The built environment is our human-made environment that provides a setting for human activity. It's our streets, our buildings, lighting, parks, neighborhoods, cities, etc. This process of creating change is not done in a vacuum. It happens through collaboration between many different stakeholders. A stakeholder is an individual or entity that has a concern or st stands to gain benefit from an initiative. In this case, the initiative of planning and design. Stakeholders can be community members, community-based organizations, banks, technical professionals, and government, to name a few. And so you'll see them pop up in different ways in, in the many um, projects that I'll present to you. The built environment is made and operated by stakeholders differently. You have community members, community, government agencies, nonprofit organizations, developers who each make and operate parts of the built environment. For example, in these three images here, there is the community garden on the right. It's created by community members coming together and creating a green space for themselves. The community garden is maintained and operated through the organization of individuals who dedicate their time to upkeep this space. 
The second image of the High Line in New York City, for those who've traveled to New York, you might be familiar with it. Um, it was created by an organization by the name of Friends of the High Line, who, who came together to advocate to the government to transform an, an abandoned elevated train line into a public trail. This organization is also responsible for the operation and maintenance of this space. So they are a nonprofit organization that's responsible for operating and maintaining this space. They may continuously apply for, for, apply for private funding and create new programs for the space for not only the immediate community, but also for tourists. Finally, in the third image, you have the, you have the Prospect Park in New, in New York, in Plin, New York. And this is owned and operated by the Parks Department, New York City Parks Department. And they are responsible for the operation and maintenance of this park. And it's funded in part by city taxes as a public amenity. All of these examples provide a much needed green space in the city, but are created and maintained in very different ways. These different ways of city making and managing allows for increased equity, diversity, and inclusion in the built environment. They exemplify many ways that the planning is used at different levels to create environments that make connections between people, place, nature, and the built environment. But those are not always their goal, goals, and they're not always, and these goals are not always achieved in the built environment. So I want to move on to looking at public housing. Public housing in New York is owned and managed by the New York City Housing Authority. The process of creating public housing in New York in the 40s and 50s was not an equitable one. Low-income people and those considered as part of the underclass were barred from living in public housing. It was built for the working class, more specifically, the white working class. However, by the end of the 1960s, the profile of residents changed as did the, as did the neighborhoods surrounding many of the developments. The residents went from majority white working class to majority black and low income. In addition, the level of maintenance de declined as the buildings experienced significant wear and tear. This model of design for public housing transformed neighborhoods as these cruciform buildings, as you see in the, in the lower left-hand corner image, these cruciform brick towers were placed in large green spaces and set apart from the street. Anywhere you go in the city, you know public housing when you see it. Because of the typical look and placement of buildings, leaving communities without aesthetic beauty and character, the planning and design of these developments also left the grounds, and when I say grounds, I mean the areas that you interact with when you're walking around these developments. Many of them built, many, many buildings void of public amenities, such as retail, playgrounds, and an active public life. In addition, there are policies put in place to limit the ability of residents to actively use the significant amount of open land that accompanies the residential towers. This is a prime example of inequitable development, where most of the low-income population of New York City are concentrated in particular neighborhoods, many of which have limited transportation, public investment, access to government services, and quality resources. This poses a unique challenge for urban designers and planners in the city. So I, I wanna talk a bit about a project that I worked on while um, working for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice in New York City. I worked there for three years. I worked for a team called the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety. And in this initiative, we, we focused on 15 public housing developments throughout the city. You can see them on this map um, with the red dots indicated there. And what, what um, all these different housing developments shared were that they were situated in neighborhoods with, that were struggling with, with high crime. And this is not to say that there is significant crime across the city, but that crime was concentrated in, in key locations. It's currently concentrated in key locations across the city. And it's not because people live in public housing, it's because people are experiencing hardships in these neighborhoods. And what's interesting in light of the crisis that we're currently experiencing is that many of these neighborhoods also overlap with the communities that are hardest hit by the COVID-19. And so what they have been experiencing for a significant amount of time is marginalization, lack of investment, 
a lack of significant investment, um, overcrowded housing, high poverty rates, unemployment. These are just issues that have evolved as a result of the concentration of low income um, people in one, in one location, in one particular neighborhood. And also I would say at the foundation of all of this is institutional racism. If it wasn't for the fact these, that these locations were primarily Black and Latino, they wouldn't be experiencing the kind of ne neglect that they are experiencing. And so now, today, these communities are, are dealing with the results of this legacy of, of racism. And so as a part of this project, we wanted, we, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice was deeply invested in these communities in a way that really strive to build capacity and support local initiatives to improve their environments. Um, I just wanna give a few definitions. The first is about open space. Open space are areas that are public and accessible. Our streets, our sidewalks, our public parks, or private with limited access. Private streets, parks, green space, or parking lots. There is a difference between passive open space and active open space. Passive has limited programs and amenities, like lawns, paths, and seating areas, as you see in the top image. And active open space has programs and amenities, such as playgrounds and sports fields, much of what you see in parks. In particularly in New York City Housing Authority, which these images reflect, spaces in public housing are semi-public, in that they are owned and managed by the housing authority, but they are accessible to the public. So they're in this really in-between place where it's not a public park, it's not owned and operated by the parks department. It's owned and operated by a, an authority, an institution such as the New York City Housing Authority. And so that has a huge impact on what can be done on these spaces by residents. So in the top image, um, while we were working with residents, they were really interested in transforming this space that's fenced in into a serenity garden. And in many public housing developments in New York City, many of the open spaces are fenced in like this to really to prevent people from um, laundering, from, to prevent them from throwing trash and whatnot onto these sites. But it's also well known that open space is really the place where community comes together, where social bonds are formed. And if you don't, and if your open spaces are fenced in, what does that mean for your ability for your community to come together and to, to create social bonds? It limits your capacity to do that. And you can see in this image, there's also trash on one end of the, of the path. There is some construction um, debris and, and, and materials on another side. So it really is an, a, an environment that is conducive for people wanting to go outside and linger and enjoy their, their open space. And this is what the, many of the residents were, were feeling challenged by. This community was also experiencing challenges of mental health issues and substance abuse issues. And they felt they really wanted to create a space where people could come together and address these needs. They could connect with nature in a way that helps them address their mental um, health issues. Or they can even have programming in a space where they can bring in outside service providers to provide services to their community. And so we took, we took resident, a resident team through a significant amount of training in partnership with their local police officers to understand what does it mean to organize their community? How can they achieve the transformation of public open space? Um, really uh, helping them understand how they can play a role in the transformation of the spaces around their community. We also provided them funding so that they could transform this area. And so this image on below is a, is a vision of what they wanted to see in this particular space. They wanted to take down the fence, they wanted to put in a gazebo, they wanted to put really create an environment where people can feel safe, to linger, to relax, and to find respite. And so what was transformed over time was it, it became more than that, so much more than that. It became a space where so many people came together to help these residents make this dream into reality, to make this vision into reality. In this image in the lower right hand corner, you see residents, you see people in the black t-shirts, those are residents that actually live in the development. And all of those in the blue t-shirts are all the many different um, 
organizations in the community that came together to help them make this Serenity Garden a real thing. There are banks, there are nonprofit organizations, there are commu other community members. So this open space became a representation of just togetherness. It, came, it became a place of collaboration for many different stakeholders in the community. And it's quite powerful, the, the ability of open space to do that. And planning, and, and all of this is because the residents put together a plan for how they wanted this space to be transformed. And this is an example of how government and nonprofit and just, you know, residents can come together to transform a space through the planning and implementation. So, you know, in this conversation, I also want to bring up just urban design. Urban design is the practice that bridges architecture, urban planning, and landscape architecture. It shapes the cities and neighborhoods that we live in. With that said, the how behind the shape and physical form of cities is collaborative. Every aspect of urban planning and design is collaborative. In my work as an urban designer, I have led teams of architects, designers of buildings, transportation planners who consult on movement systems such as road networks, buses, trains, etc. Landscape architects responsible for modifying the visible features of open space, to name a few. These are a, name, a, number, a few of the consultants I've worked with. Each contributes their expertise to how a space will be formed or transformed over time. All of these layers come together in the urban design framework. And the urban design framework is the future vision for the transformation of the shape and form of an area, a city, a neighborhood, or a community. So for, for five years of my life, I, I lived in Cape Town, South Africa, a really beautiful city. And South Africa is a very beautiful country. And um, I lived there for five years, working as an urban designer and planner. And it was really an interesting time because it was around the time that South Africa had been, had was celebrating its 20th year post-apartheid. And the apartheid system was a, was a political system, a, a social, socially political system that created division in, um, based on racism in South Africa. And that um, system was integrated into the way cities were designed and planned. And so 20 years post-apartheid, um, Cape Town was looking to use urban design and planning as a way to address the reverse, the reverse of, of, to reverse the impacts of the apartheid system. And so one, one of an interesting aspects of South Africa's constitution is that, it, is that it protects everyone's right to access of adequate housing. And housing entails more than just bricks and mortar. It requires available land, appropriate services such as the provision of water and the removal of sewage and the financing of all of these, including the building of the house itself. So in the constitution, the government has stated that every um, citizen has a right to housing, meaning they have the right to all of these bundle of things, land, services, housing, et cetera. And that has a, had a huge impact, has a huge impact on the way urban planning and design and the way that the distribution of land happens in South Africa. So you can see on this map, um, there's, a neighbor, there's a community highlighted called Deep Freeze. And this was a com one community I worked in where we were looking to plan a, um, to transform a neighborhood. And it's about, it was about 30 minute drive outside of Cape Town. I lived in Cape Town, so I would continuously drive in back and forth to this city of, called Deep Freeze. And one of the challenges for Cape Town and the reason why it's often known as the apartheid city is that the city itself was designed for the white um, class, um, whereas black people were only able to live on the peripheries of the city, about half an hour away. So one of these neighborhoods, Kailicha, Deep Freeze, these are, all, these are all communities where only black people were allowed to live. And oftentimes those areas did not have adequate lighting, water, sewage removal, et cetera. All people could do was build shacks on these locations. And they would, have to move, they would have to migrate into the city every day to work, to be the servants, cooks, et cetera, and then migrate back during the evening. 
And because the city of, of, of Cape Town was designed this way, even 30 years later, post-apartheid, it still functions in the same way, which is unfortunate. So I spent time working in this this deep freeze community. It's an existing community that was comprised of 171 households, many of which were descendants of employees of a series of manufacturing factories that you see in the upper um, right hand corner. Um, one of those factories was called, um, was named Deep Freeze. It was a deep freeze factory, hence the name of the community, Deep Freeze. Um, so the, the residents that lived here, they, they, um, they did not have land ownership and they fought for a really long time for the land to be transferred into their own, into their own ownership, for them to own the land. And have the land, land uh, ownership transferred over. And the housing that they currently lived in um, was originally an army barracks from World War II that had been degraded over time. And so the city of Cape Town purchased the site this, the site that's where the boundaries of the black dotted line, they purchased that site in order with the intention to prepare the land for development and also to provide land to the many people who do not live in this community, many people who are on the housing waiting list. So because of this constitutional right for people to have housing, to have land, adequate resources, adequate uh, resources, et cetera, the city of Cape Town is continuously looking for available land that they can then begin to prepare for development, divide it, and give it away to, to people who need housing. And so the challenge here was to strike a compromise through urban planning and design to address both the needs of the existing community and the needs of the local government. Typically, in planning, you start a project with objectives to guide your work moving forward. In this project, the objectives were to one, improve the spatial integration of the poor and low income households for better access to socioeconomic opportunities. And so spatial integration refers to transforming the built environment to achieve improved outcomes. So transforming this land area and the buildings within it to, to achieve improved outcomes. And these outcomes being more investment in business to the area so people can have continued jobs and sustainability. The second objective is sustainable development, essentially redesigning this area in a way that includes long-term thinking about how present changes will impact future generations. And the third objective is to upgrade infrastructure. Infrastructure is, in, is composed of public and private physical improvements, such as roads, railways, bridges, tunnels, water supply, sewers, electrical grids, and telecommunication. So you can see from this image that you don't really see a whole lot of roads, tarred roads on the site. And so this was a part of the infrastructure upgrading that needed to happen. And so, the, so my task was to create a plan for how that, that area, this area would be upgraded. So this is just an image, it's just to show you what the existing conditions look like. And often in urban planning, you have to go and assess the, the existing conditions. There were many shacks, and when I say shack, there are the images that you see in the bottom um, half, the two images in the bottom, where people have taken corrugated metal and patched them together to create a home or to create a shop. Um, so this, this whole entire, this community, this existing community was pretty homemade. Um, in the upper image, you see that there's some ponding happening, and this is because there isn't adequate, um, there isn't adequate um, infrastructure underneath the, the path in order to hold water and to transport it through the sewer lines. So, you know, this was, again, one of the objectives of the plan. Community engagement is also a critical part of, of urban planning and design. Community engagement is the process that facilitates communication, interaction, involvement, and, and exchange between an organization and any community for a range of social and organizational activities. So in these series of images, I continuously went to this community to meet with resident leaders. So these were community leaders that had been designated by the residents as the key people that would communicate with the city of Cape Town, the gov local government. And often I was an intermediary between that. 
And also, there are often also politicians, so elected officials who are part of this conversation. In the upper left-hand corner, you see the gentleman in the blue shirt. He was known as a ward counselor, who was, was all our council member. And um, he had a stake in this project in that he, off, he served to, to negotiate with the city of Cape Town to purchase the land so that it can be transformed for the residents. And so he had an interest in this project being seen all the way through, because if it succeeded, then perhaps residents would continue to vote for him as an elected official. And so you can see that there are, there are lots of politics and negotiations involved in this um, work of planning. And the plan itself is a tool for negotiation between many different stakeholders. And we often have to take the feedback from many different people who may have opposing interests um, to, to form a, a compromise through land planning. So this, is, this image just indicates where the key central area is. Just I highlighted that in red, just so you can focus your attention on that. And so what I've done here is I'm, I'm highlighting where there are natural paths of movement on the site. So these are places where people go to and fro when they're going from one house to another, or when they're going from a local business to their home. These are the, the, the typical paths that people take. They haven't been made official or formal by creating roads, but th this is actually how people naturally move through the site. And it's important as a part of the initial stages to, to document that. How are people naturally moving? So that when you create a plan for transforming the area, you don't want to disrupt the natural way that people move and, 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 um, and use their community. The purple circles indicate areas where um, they've naturally located their local businesses and their public buildings. And again, you don't want to change that orientation because you want to create a plan that allows people to continue to live their life the way that they are comfortably living. Because again, this, is, this plan is for um, the, the residents, it's not for myself. And so this image now, what I've highlighted around is where that original plan was. And what I've done, and what I did here was really begin to um, create a framework around that plan, begin to define where the roads would be, where other um, plots of land would be. So you can see that these larger squares are where existing homes are situated, but then I've created some lines and squares to indicate where future homes can be, so that this whole neighborhood can be filled in and create opportunities for housing for other people. And so as I'd mentioned before, that an urban design framework is really a collaboration between landscape architects, transportation planners, architects, et cetera. There's so many different specialties that go into layering information into an urban design framework. And so when you're, and you start with developing the urban, the urban structure, and the urban structure starts with establishing where, what are the road networks, the movement networks? How are people going to walk through this site? How are they going to drive through this site? How are they essentially going to move through between getting from their home to local business to leaving the community? And so the transportation planner um, often um, will advise on the best type of road network and, and how you can differentiate between major roads where you'll have commercial activity and minor roads that are really situated within neighborhoods. And that's how these different colors distinguish those different levels of, of roads. And roads can be quite multifunctional. Um, streets can serve multiple pur purposes. Aside from being the conveyors of mobility and transportation, they can also incorporate green infrastructure. And these images demonstrate what green infrastructure is. The images show some examples of design and identified by the landscape architect on how to tr transform sideway, sidewalks so that they use, use nature to absorb rainwater. So the streets were designed so that the trees could be places to absorb rainwater and the sidewalks would direct, and the streets would direct all rainwater to these particular trees to allow rain to, to leave the site. And so you don't have ponding as you saw in those original images. And this was, a, this was planned for to address those challenges. Another aspect of the urban design framework are to establish 
axes and nodes. And axes are essentially view corridors. They allow you to stand at one end and be able to see all straight through to another end of the community. And they help to orient people. You know, at the intersection of an axis, you're going to be you're going to turn a corner and find perhaps a major amenity at that intersection. And so, and uh, where all the amenities are located, they are located at nodes, and locate and nodes are centers of activity. So you can see in the legend on the left hand side, over here, that there are institutional nodes, and the institutional nodes are essentially where you have your public schools, your libraries. Um, maybe your hospitals. These are the places where all your, your public institutions are located. Your commercial node, as, as mentioned in the term commercial, they are the place where you have your businesses. So there are two key nodes for, for major businesses. And there are a lot of your economic activity is happening in those places. And then your central community nodes, they might be the places where you have your parks, your plazas, um, your, your recreational centers, your community centers, they'll be the place where community comes together um, for recreation. And so it's important in an urban design framework to establish where those nodes and axes are located and how the axes are used to connect different nodes to each other. Another aspect of uh, a framework is land use. And land use is essentially is the distribution of how land is used on a site. And you can see in this image that there's much residential land use, but then there's also a designation of community use and open space and industrial use. And so what this does is it establishes for the future where different uses are, uses are going to be located within this framework, within the urban structure that's been established. And so I mentioned before that this, this plan represented a negotiation between the city of Cape Town and um, the residents. And so in this image here, you see that there's like a clear dividing line between the red squares and the kind of white and purple squares. And so in this central location where many of the residents were, were living already, all these purple squares are larger. And what they re represent are larger pieces of land that will be divided up and given to the family. And this was a part of the negotiation. The negotiation was that the residents could keep their area of the, the community. They could have land that was divided for themselves and for their children so that they could stabilize their families into the future. And that the edge of community would then be divided into smaller plots of land and given away to other to residents outside of this neighborhood who are in need of, of affordable housing, who are in need of housing, period. Um, and so this was the negotiation. So the city of Cape Town was able to use one side of the land to address their housing shortage. And then the other part of the land was used for the residents to accommodate themselves and their families and so that they could um, live and thrive in this community into the future. And so another layer on top of that, you are now working with a landscape architect who, who supports us in creating the, the open space framework and subdividing that open space. So there's different kinds of open space. There are parks, there are gardens, there are plazas. And so this urban space framework begins to differentiate all those different areas where there are gonna be green land, places for, for sports fields, places that are just for, for greenlands, et cetera, and so forth. And then also um, highlights the key connector between those different spaces. So as you're moving through this site, you can easily access all of the the open spaces in the community. And so all of these elements come together in, in an image of the framework. And yes, it's a beautiful image, but you can see by the story that I've told that it encompasses and embodies so much, so many layers of negotiation, um, consultation by different consultants. And the urban designer and planner is really the convener of all this different bits of information into one drawing that represents a future vision of this community. And so as this community develops into to the future, it will constantly, um, the, the government will, will constantly refer back to this plan to see where they're going. It's kind of like a direction point. It's your, this, this plan becomes the North Star for future development in the community. And so it could be, a, it could be you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years before the full vision is realized, but it sets a plan for how that can happen. 
So I'm, I want to just show another project um, in the city of Cape Town. Um, this is um, by the waterfront, and it was a project called the Somerset Precinct. And um, it, Somerset Precinct is a historic location of a, of a hospital, this site that's highlighted in red lights, in, in red lines. Um, it's currently is predominantly used by people, the hospital itself is used by people who, who don't even live close to the city center, the people that are living in the informal settlements of township communities that I talked about in previous projects. And the city of, Gover the city of Cape Town had the intentions of moving this hospital farther away and transforming this site into a, a community with residences and businesses um, to improve the land in anticipation of future development by removing some of the insignificant existing buildings and improving infrastructure so that new development can happen on the site. Presently, the site is surrounded by walls. So one of the objectives is to create a future vision for, for an open, public, nurturing place. And the other objectives are very similar to the other project I showed you, which are sustainable development and creating a vision for a place where people can live, work, and play. And this is a highly significant site because it's right by the waterfront. It's right by a, a stadium that was built for the 2010 FIFA World Cup. So it was a very valuable site that wasn't really living up to its potential. So this is the design framework that I created while working for a consulting firm called ARG Design in Cape Town. And um, there are many aspects to this urban design framework that you see here. And I wanna highlight what those different aspects are. And the first is our axes, visual links and views. And I'd indicated before that axes are really those view corridors. What a framework is supposed to do is it's supposed to frame the, um, the amazing qualities of a neighborhood or, or site. And so in this particular neighborhood, you have the, the stadium, you have the waterfront, you have the mountain, you had amazing amenities surrounding the site. And so the framework was meant to create, to create a, a frame around those places and really to highlight them. And so the actually the so being so being very aware of those views and of those axes was important to this frame. A second element was zoning and massing. And one principle too used to control the design of future buildings and development is zoning. Zoning is used as a tool by urban planners and urban planners and designers to divide land into land uses such as residential, commercial, industrial, etc. It's also used to regulate the size and mass and placement of buildings. In other words, urban form. You can see that each, each building here seems to have a skin around it, like a light colored blue skin. Um, and, the red, and the red line that I've highlighted here, that I put here, it represents the zoning envelope. And what that is meant to do is create the boundaries for future development. Massing, which is within that envelope now, the blue line that I indicated there, is the form of a building in three dimensions. It defines both the interior space and the exterior shape of the building. So that blue line is just one example of how a building can be designed within that larger zoning envelope. So throughout this site, you see there are, there are white solid forms, which is just like exemplary of how design can happen within that larger zoning envelope. But that zoning envelope presents, it, 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 prevents, it presents a restriction for future development. So as architects perhaps are getting one or multiple of these sites, they cannot design beyond that zoning envelope. And so it assures just the future framework of this, this future framework into the future in, in development. So another aspect of the framework is um, open space. And I mentioned that before what open space was. It can be parks, plazas, et cetera. And it's important to, to, to create um, to, to use the zoning envelope to frame those open spaces and to provide places where people can enjoy air, they can connect to nature, they can be able to access the site and um, just to enjoy, to have respite. So it's important in a framework, in an urban design framework to establish those locations. And another area is our gateways. And so these are entry points into, into a neighborhood and you want to, to celebrate them and create a place where people know that they're moving into a different space so that they can respect the space within that, that, um, that neighborhood. And oftentimes you might see trees in a gateway, you might see a fencing, you might see a sign that says welcome to this neighborhood, but gateways can be 
um, differentiated in many different ways. And so finally, there's also heritage setbacks. So I'd mentioned before that there were a number of historic buildings in this development, in, in, the, in the existing site. Many of them had to be removed, but there were a number of them that were really significant. They'd been built in the 20s, 30s, 40s, et cetera. And so they were very historically significant, and so they were maintained. And so the framework itself also creates a way of celebrating them by, by creating setbacks, which are um, zones around each building that you cannot build within. And the zoning envelope, you can see, sort of just cradles each of those open spaces that are surrounding the historic buildings. So what that does for the ground experience is that it establishes those view corridors. You can see in this image that you can stand on one end and, and view all the way down. So, the, so into the future, you know that there will be no building that will keep, prevent your ability to see where you're going or to see the view up ahead. And this, these are just renderings of, the, of the, the project. And again, this image here shows that you can have a, an, ama an amazing view of the stadium, but also be able to stand away from the historic building and, um, and, view, its and view its beauty um, in a setting that doesn't overpower it. And so that, that was the intention of the, of the framework as well. So I wanna move into another um, type of planning. And, and really talk about how other disciplines are involved in planning and design. As I mentioned before, um, planning and design is quite collaborative and um, there are more, many forms of planning. And so I wanna talk about one that is very dear to my heart. Um, I mentioned before, I'm a founding board member of the Black Space Urbanist Collective. We are a collective of black urban professionals. We are based in New York City, but we also have chapters in Chicago and in Oklahoma City. And we are architects, we are planners, we are artists, we are graphic designers, we are industrial designers, we are lawyers, we are economists, we, we, range, we, we, we range all many different disciplines. But what we're quite excited about is our cities and particularly black communities and how black communities are faring in, in cities. And our vision is to demand a present and future where black people, black spaces, and black culture matter and thrive. And we do this through creative projects where we, we work collaboratively to make this happen. And so historic preservation is, is at the heart of our work. And we think historic preservation is important. And historic preservation is essentially um, the, the work of preserving those cultural assets, those, those historic assets, whether it be a building, art pieces, parts of a community, a street, a building, preserving those things so that the history and culture of that com community continues to thrive into the future. And so I just wanna talk briefly about a project that I worked on in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which is a historic African-American community in New York. And we, we did this project for one year while um, working in Brownsville with residents. And we identified what were the ways that residents and, and the community itself, the neighborhood, was preserving their heritage and their culture. And we knew that people were doing it by advocating for streets to be named um, differently, but buildings to be named differently. They had writing circles where writers were writing stories about the community. They had public murals that were, demonst that were highlighting community leaders. So they were doing many different things to really demonstrate in the built environment the importance of their heritage. Um, and so we felt that it, what was important was to establish a series of principles where how we were going to work in this community to highlight this work, but then also to encourage more work around cultural preservation, historic preservation. And so the principles on the left-hand side, which I will talk about later, are really embody the, the, the meaning behind the work we wanted to do in this community. And so our process was, was quite iterative. It was very, um, we didn't come in with any intentions. We wanted to start with reflections. We wanted to talk to people and hear what they, uh, learn more about the work they were doing in the community, but then also go co-create with them. So we would come away, think about our own tech, technical expertise, incorporate that, and then go back to the community, learn from them. And so there was this give and take, and our process was very cyclical. So we would go back, report back our work, and then get more feedback. And so there was this continuous cycle of working with, with residents. And so what came out of this process was just a method of working uh, with, with Black communities around this notion of heritage 
conservation heritage preservation. We interviewed residents, we worked with their writing, with their writing circles, we talked to kids, and we talked to cultural producers. And cultural producers are the people that produce those murals, those, those festivals. They, they produce all the events in the community. They write stories about the community. These are the people that produce those artifacts of culture in their community. And we wanted to create a network of, of those different cultural producers. And that was one of the outcomes of this particular project was creating that network and, and then giving them some energy um, around cultural preservation that they could work towards. Um, in closing, you know, what came out of this was a series of 14 principles that we refer to as the Black Space Manifesto. And we use these principles in teaching, we use them in training, we use them, um, we share them, we sell these, we, these uh, manifesto principles um, we have it on our website, and we, we've created it as a tool for practitioners who are working in Black communities. We know oftentimes urban planners and designers, um, when they're working in Black communities, it's perceived that they're contributing to gentrification. And so as a way to address that challenge, we wanted to create a series of principles that would help um, just people better work more collaboratively with residents in the process of planning because working with residents is an important part of planning and so moving at the speed of trust meant we had to be very slow and intentional with our work as i mentioned in uh, talking about our process planning with designing with means we had to continuously go back to residents and, and and to get feedback on the work that we were doing moving forward um, and also protecting and strengthening culture. We wanted to make sure we identified who were producing cultural artifacts in the community and, and elevate those people and, and the work that they were doing. And so um, if you want to learn more about Black Space, you can certainly reach us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, on Black Space, Black Space Org. We also have a website, blackspace.org. Um, and so I just, in summary, I, I think, you know, I, I've shared for you all just, you know, three different ways that planning can be articulated or done in a community. You know, government does planning, nonprofits do planning, um, you know, residents can do planning as well on their own. People are empowered to create visions, future visions for their communities, their neighborhoods, their cities, and transform those places in many different ways, either through frameworks or through advocacy or through private development. Um, that, you know, planning really is about this dynamic force of many different um, parties coming together. And um, I hope that I've just shared enough that, that you know, helps you understand how it, how it all works, the process involved and the, 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 you know, even the political and negotiation oriented nature of it all. And um, yeah, and so I'm open to questions and I thank you so much for the opportunity for me to share this work. So I'm going to see what questions are available. Um, so the first was about the, the neighborhoods marked in red on the map. I think that was the first map I was, I was showing in the beginning of the presentation. Those neighborhoods were um, the, the neighborhoods that I worked in as a part of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. They were, um, the, they were the, red, the red marked different public housing developments situated in those neighborhoods. Um, so, okay, so about the Bronx project, the question is, did you collect the residents' insights and feedback on the initiative? How was their feedback relevant to the shape of the final project? Absolutely. We, we, I mean, it, the, the residents were responsible for creating their own project. So in that particular instance, they got our feedback and then went and changed their, their, and adjusted their ideas and implemented them. So absolutely, residents were at the forefront. They were the drivers of the project in the first project that I'd shown in the Bronx in New York City as a part of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. We've, we funded them, we provided, we provided whatever support necessary, but they were the drivers of that key project. So in cities that may not have as many resources in, as New York City, how do you see urban planners helping? I think I shared in some of the projects, um, particularly in Cape Town, where you know, I was working in, in areas that are resource limited, you can see that, urban that for me as an urban planner, urban designer, I served to, I used my skills as an urban planner to create a, a point of negotiation 
to, to create compromise, to, to establish compromise. And, you know, that's a really big part of urban planning. I would say one of the primary aspects of urban planning is, is using your skills to, to facilitate a compromise between many different voices and making sure that they all have an equal um, role in, in determining the future vision for that area, city, community, et cetera. Um, what are some of the top skills urban planners need to be successful, equitable facilitators? Um, I think you should definitely look on blackspace.org at our Black Space Manifesto. I think that manifesto is really quite amazing and it really speaks to, um, you know, how, how to work, how to operate. You need to be able to facilitate conversation. You need to be able to think comprehensively. You need to be able to be neutral. Um, you need to be hum a humble listener. Um, you need to be able to um, be, you know, willing to speak to everyone, not only the people in the room, but those are who are on the margins who are not able to be in the room because you want to be able to create a future vision that is, that works for everyone. So that's, those are the important aspects. Um, so the next question is, in the process of community engagement, when creating a plan for development, what approaches do you use to balance the needs, desires, and expectations of the community and the expertise, big picture perspective that individuals such as yourself bring to the table? That may at times crash, clash. So um, I would say that they, I haven't really experienced a point where they cl clash tremendously. Um, my role as an urban planner designer is, in the, and the big picture is really about how they all come together seamless, seamlessly. That is, that's what um, I perceive as my expertise in the big picture, not to, you know, um, not to, and also to think about what are, be, what are best practices too, because there might be goals that each side wants to achieve. And, and so through my expertise, my technical expertise, I know how to make those, those um, goals achievable. And so the big picture is really thinking through how those different interests come together in a way that can be sustainable, that can be aesthetically beautiful, you know, that can be a quality living environment. Do you have any suggestions for books, websites, et cetera, for those, for those of us who are interested in equitable and inclusive urban design to learn more? Um, again, I would say go to blackspace.org and look at our Black Space Manifesto. I think it's a really great, um, it's a really great tool. And in terms of equitable, inclusive um, urban design, it, there's definitely um, at Harvard University there's a lab called the Just City Lab, and it's led by Tony Griffin, and she has a book um, that she edited called the Just City Essays. And that book in itself is, is a really great resource. It has stories from cities all over the world, from architects and planners all over the world who talk about equitable and inclusive urban design. And they just, they're telling stories about their city and strategies used to address inequity in their cities. And so I think that's a really great resource, Just City. And also, she also produced this thing called the Just City Index, which is also a way of sort of measuring um, whether a project can be its level of um, contribution to the just city. So I think those are great resources. In your experience, especially with attention to differences between U.S. and international communities, how much have you encountered interest or active advocating for embedding principles of environmental sustainability? beyond just having parks landscaping into urban planning and design. Um, you know, I think that's, you know, environmental sustainability is, is, quite, is quite complex. And from the work that I've done, lands, you know, using green areas, landscaping and parks have been a part of the strategy for environmental sustainability. Um, as mentioned in, the, in one, the Deep Freeze project that we use strategies of, of incorporating green infrastructure, which is using, um, you know, the green areas to, to work as, is very similar to just like um, underground infrastructure, such as sewer lines and water lines, et cetera, um, in order to, to um, distribute rainwater on, on a particular site or stormwater. So, um, and I think the plan itself 
is an advocacy tool. Because just because embedded in the plan is a, is a um, our designs to incorporate green infrastructure doesn't necessarily mean that they need funds to do that in the future. So the, the plan itself is an advocacy tool for the city to incorporate environmental sustainability into its future development of a, of a neighborhood. Okay, so the next question was, when involved in a project like Deep Freeze, how are the needs and concerns of future residents incorporated? Existing services are logically in the existing areas of the community, which means newer parts of the community will be further away, similarly with the open spaces. So with this um, particular project, the, the main need that, that, um, that the residents had were to, to be able to think of a future. Um, to have a future place where they could live that they know that they owned and they could not be kicked out of that was really their their main interest they wanted to know that for sure when they have children that children have children that they would have ownership that they could create a legacy through this land that they've lived there so long without adequate resources and infrastructure that they wanted to be able to be in a place they wanted to be able to know that they're that they could leave a legacy for their future family so that was really the main need um, established there. And that's what we, and so the act of doing the planning for that was, was a part of that. And so being able to create a negotiation, use that plan as a negotiation between the city, the city's needs and the community's needs was really where that plan came together. So they wanted to make sure that they had place for where they could run their businesses, where they could, their children can run around and play, just really all the quality of life things that we, that everyone wants around the world. They wanted to be able to have this in their community for their future children, grandchildren, et cetera. So that was one of the goals. Could you offer advice or thoughts on planners who work for a community that they that they're new to, not familiar with. For example, if a planner moves to a new city specifically for that planning job, I would say, you know, you wanna do some walking. You wanna walk around and, and get to know the, the neighborhood. You wanna seek out community leaders or, or community-based organizations and, and start talking to them to learn more uh, about that particular community. And this is, all outside, this is all outside of just like doing desktop research where you're going on Google and learning more about the, the community or city, but you really want to get on the ground and, and learn from people, you know, learn from other practitioners. There might be professional organizations, um, local versions of professional, like the American Planning Association, they might have a local chapter there. You can also talk to other people and learn more about um, that particular community. And I think through all those resources, you should be able to at least get a, a firm understanding of who the key players are, who, who do you need to know more information about, what, what key communities and neighborhoods are the ones that are maybe like hot items or, or where a lot of that investment is going into. Do you have any advice for students who may want to switch career paths and get involved in urban planning and designing? I would say read, you know, there are an amazing array of books out there that um, talk about urban planning and design. Um, there's also the American Planning Association. You can go on the website and you know learn more information on that website. Um, there's um, there's a website called Planet to Zen um, and Suburbia. These are two websites, and they are also sort of for places where there are forums where planners come together and talk about many different issues. That's Planet to Zen and Suburb Suburbia. Um, and um, they are, there are many resources on, on those sites that you know, can help you learn more about urban planning and design, how to prepare yourself to apply, to go to you know, school for that. Um, and you know, you know, going to graduate school or going to undergrad for urban planning is an important aspect of that. If, um, but you can also just start work. Their planning is so all encompassing. I only spoke about planning in terms of like urban design and physical transformation. There's also economic development planning, the sustainability planning, there's, there's housing development planning. There's so many different kinds of plan out there that you might even be doing planning and not even know it. You might even be working in planning and not even know it, or at least getting experience towards becoming a, a professional planner.
so so um, in the deep freeze project, could you talk more about the distinction, assuming there is one, between pathways for pedestrians versus those for vehicles? Very similar to here, to here uh, or any you know anywhere in the United States, there are sidewalks. We incorporated sidewalks and and streets. So the the pathways for pedestrians were were the the public sidewalk, and then the pathways for vehicles were the public street. Um, can the principles of black space be applicable for other communities too? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, the black space principles were born out of, you know, work in, in you know, focusing on the black community, but principles such as planning with, designing with, or being humble listeners, um, or moving at the speed of trust, these are all essential for working in any community. We just wanted to emphasize that people should use this in working in Black communities because of the unique challenges that we understand to, be, to happen in Black communities. But the Black Space Manifesto can certainly be applicable in any community. And, and when I've used it in teaching, I've used it with students who are living in China, who are living in South America, who are living in the Congo, living all over the world, um, understanding how the Black Space Manifesto can be used as a tool to address justice in the built environment. I have a background in human-centered design, digital design, and service design, and I'm super interested in transitioning to urban design. How would you suggest to navigate this transition? Um, I would definitely say, you know, look into getting a, a master's degree in, in urban design, um, because it's important to really understand how to, um, the, the job of convening many different stakeholders, but also, and then also convening many different specialties. You want to be able to understand landscape architecture, architecture, transportation planning, civil engineering. You want to understand how all these other parties play a role in the, trans, in the shaping and physical form of, of cities, neighborhoods, and communities. And so it's important to really get a deep understanding of that um, by going to, back to school to, under, to learn urban design. Um, again, if, if, I'm not, if I'm not able to get to your questions, you have my email address there, my website. Please do reach out to me. Um, and, so, and I'm happy to answer any future questions. So one question here, how useful and efficient have you found crime prevention strategies to improve fear levels in the community? So in the first project where I showed that we worked in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, we used, an initi we used a, um, a methodology called crime prevention through environmental design. And that was a, an, a, an, a, a methodology created in the 70s by an architect by the name of Oscar Newman. And essentially it, it strived to use the environmental design as a way to um, fortify mostly public housing developments or housing developments to, to prevent crime from occurring in those spaces. But we looked at it very differently and it's evolved. The, the, the acronym is SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And SEPTED has evolved through the years to be a bit more comprehensive. So it's less about the physical um, fortifying of buildings, but also, but also about how to transform public areas so that they can uh, be more active, active open space, and to prevent, um, to prevent crime from occurring in those particular communities. And so um, the strategy there was really thinking, rethinking or working with residents to transform those open spaces so that they can no not just be passive, but they can be active open spaces and to really address the surveillance, because the more people you have walking and frequenting these open spaces, the more ability you have for people to see what's going on and less opportunity for crime to occur in those particular communities. Thank you for that question.
How was your experience in the U.S.? How has your experience in the U.S. informed how you did planning design in other countries and vice versa? For example, how is planning different in Cape Town compared to the Bronx? You know, quite surprisingly, um, the, a lot of the challenges and issues are, are the same. Um, I showed you in, in the, the project in Cape Town that, you know, that Cape Town was known as, this, as an apartheid city where you had the low income black South Africans that were um, limited to, to one part of the, the city outside on the fringes of the city. And then the city, the main city itself was, was really beautifully designed, um, was mostly for the white South Africans. But here in New York, you have a very similar challenge where you have some communities that are very far from the main resources and, and, and employment spaces that have been neglected over time, that um, their buildings are degrading and their infrastructure is degrading. And you know, so there are very, very similar challenges in, you know, with respect to this deep freeze project and this project in, in the Bronx in, in the public housing development of up upgrading and improving those areas. In one situation, I, I acted as the intermediary was where I was a private consultant working for the city of Cape Town, but also working for this community. But with the, the nature of the project in the Bronx, I was working as a government representative that was providing resources to this community to help them do things on their own. So I would say that, you know, the, the challenge was the same, the approach slightly different um, based on where I sat in that, in, in the, in the project. How large are urban planning teams normally? How large can they get? Um, it can range. Um, when I worked for a private consulting firm in Cape Town, my team was maybe about eight people and it ranged from, um, you know, people, well, actually, no, it was quite large because we also had, tra we had transportation planner, landscape architect, we had, um, a gra you know, graphic designer, we had um, re planners that were doing the research, the existing research of the community. Um, Okay, so I can take one or two questions. So, um, so the teams were quite large, and I, I would say that that's that's the case all the time. And I and I con and I continue and I I consider the team to be not only the team in the office, but also the resident team, the community leaders, because they are also part of creating the plan. Also, the team of people that work for the city government, they're also part of creating the plan. So, yeah, the plans could be like the the team could be like twenty people because you have so many different voices. Um, but in terms of the people actually producing the final product, it could be like a team of five people that are, are producing different aspects of the final report and urban design framework. Um, so my final, final question. Oh, great question. How do you navigate instances where best urban design practice are inhibited by public policy structures? That's a really great question. And I think that is where, you know, you really have to tap into your expertise and understanding urban design and, and how to use it as a, as a tool for compromise and as a tool for negotiation. And it really requires understanding um, public policy and how it works um, and understanding where there is an opportunity for for, for obtaining um, quick wins or, or wins across diverse stakeholders. So you might have government that is wants to enforce a particular public policy, policy but they also want to achieve other goals. And so urban, an urban designer, urban planner can use their understanding of urban design to bring to the table that you can achieve this goals by adjusting this policy in this way. And it can be, and the result can be in, uh, something that impacts the the built environment and the form and shape of, of cities. So I think it's that, you know, navigating that is really being quite savvy and clever and understanding how policy impacts the built environment, understanding, you know, really what the tools of urban design practice are and, and really understanding how the two can work together to transform the places and spaces that we live in. So thank you again so much for this opportunity um, to, to share my work um, to the Goethe Institute, Farm Function Studio, and DC Public Library. If you can reach me at ifomaarc at gmail.com if you have any future questions, if I haven't been able to, you know, answer one, some of the many amazing questions 
in this chat. Thank you again so much.